I'm very privileged to get to introduce you to someone who through her own efforts has healed more people than a faith healer. She has done more for humanity than anybody I ever knew, with few exceptions. There are a few good ones out there that I've known um, and had the privilege to know. I believe that not one was a psychiatrist. Kathy O'Brien has, um, has grabbed the hearts of many people by speaking to them on a level of pure logic. And I'm, I know that you folks will gain much from her testimony today. She is absolutely the most pure person I know. <laughs> Welcome, Kathy. Thanks. Love is the greatest healer. Oh, I'm so happy to be here today. I'm here with a happy mind. Not the kind of happy that's just a giddy emotion or anything like that, but a happy mind. The kind of mind that is free from fear, bitterness, negativity, all those horrible things that we see on the news and all like that is not healthy for us. I'm here with a happy mind. The kind of, the kind of happiness that allows for life to unfold the way that it should, where synchronicity and coincidences line up and confirm that you're on the right path and doing the right thing. That kind of happiness that allows for free thought, expanded thinking, and knowing more of what's going on in this world than just what we're told. Negati negativity and fear immobilizes. That's why we're being bombarded with it constantly on television. The violence, the constant violent images, the negativity, the fear, those are the things that make it difficult to be able to stand up and make a positive difference in the world. It's the kind of thing that just dashes hope. It takes away that, that ability to have the spiritual strength to stand up and enjoy your life and live the meaningful life that we're all meant to live. I feel so fortunate to have survived my ordeal to know this truth because this is the kind of truth that I want to share with everybody because we all deserve it. We all should know that there's so much more available to our lives than what we're seeing through politics, and war, environmental disasters, the horrors that are on TV. Social engineering through the media is a deliberate effort to suppress the spirit of the people. It's a del deliberate effort to control the people. There's a criminal faction in control of our government, and they know that people are easily led by fear. They know what happens to the brain. Whether we just you know, make that choice or don't make that choice, our brains respond to trauma the same way, and they know that. That information on how our brains respond to trauma has been repressed from the mental health community and from all of us. It's our brain, we have a right to know this important information. We need to know that when trauma occurs in our society that we're all highly suggestible and easily led. Mind control is an important truth that is like the piece of the puzzle that once you understand mind control, that piece of the puzzle brings the whole picture into focus and we start understanding 
what is going on in our world. And with that understanding, once we know that truth, once we have that awareness, that's the first step towards positive change. These criminals that are in control of our government, in control of our media, in control of our knowledge base and information, have been in power for a long time. They've been using this technique on us for decades. It seems like things are worse right now because we see so much violence on TV, we see so much horror. When in fact, that is awareness starting. The truth is coming out. It's starting to rise. And with that awareness comes the first step towards the positive, necessary change that we all need to reclaim control over our own lives and to be able to gather our strength of spirit and start living that life with a happy mind again where everything happens at such a profound level and it's so meaningful. We all will get to live that again as we fully understand exactly what is happening to our society. Mind control is a sliding scale and it affects people on a very robotic level, such as um, military special forces, such as the kind of mind control that I experienced during the Reagan Bush administration when I was totally robotic, carrying out the will of others and doing only what I was told to do. My experience was extreme, but it's given me insight into the deliberate machine that's being used to manipulate the minds of the masses. It gave me inside knowledge from inside the White House Pentagon level that I was subjected to. And it's given me the insight in my own healing path. Once I regain control over my own mind, what a joy it is to celebrate free thought every day and to make personal choices. One of my biggest personal choices that I have made is to choose happiness. I choose happiness. Not giddiness, not ignoring the realities of what's going on in the world, but that that happy mind that allows for clarity of thinking to be able to see the solutions and to see beyond what we're being told, to be able to see beautiful people like yourselves who can't relate to the kind of violent nonsense that we're seeing every day any more than I can. TV doesn't... TV and the media doesn't represent us any more than the criminals in control of our government do. They don't represent us either. And exposing them for their deliberate plan against us is a first step towards the real change in our government and in our school systems and in our lives. Using the example of my, uh, my life's experience may help to understand exactly how mind control works. I was horribly abused as a child, and when I was growing up, Project Paperclip had brought in the Nazi and fascist scientists from Germany, along with the mind control information that had been used on, um, on the people in Germany during the years of, of Hitler's reign. That information, we didn't really win, win the war per se. Instead, we just simply transferred it over here. That information on mind control was well known by the CIA. And there's an MK Ultra mind control that was going on at the time that I was born. So I was born at a time when this was just first being implemented. And it was known from that Hitler Himmler research that any child that was being sexually abused like I was, any child that was being used in pornography like I was, would be a prime candidate or a chosen one for MK Ultra mind control. It wasn't that I knew that what was being done to me was wrong or that I was even being abused. I didn't have the capacity for that kind of understanding. For one, my whole environment was saturated with it. My family was sexually abusing me, Catholic Church was sexually abusing me, and 
um, subjecting me to horrible occult trauma. It was all around. Even my grandfather's Blue Masonic Lodge had a lot of political people attending it that were, um, that were also abusing me. So it seemed like the whole world was. Even law enforcement was involved. So where was I going to turn? There wasn't really any place to turn, and I didn't know that it should be any different than what I was experiencing, except for that I hoped so much inside myself that there was some place in the world where people were kind to each other, where they were happy, where they were good to each other. I knew that that had to be because it was something that I could, I could still feel inside of me at that time. Well, while I was still really little and the abuse was going on, my father's sexual abuse of me, even though I didn't know it as abuse, was creating a response in my brain that same response we all get to trauma, where the subconscious mind is wide open and easily led. Our subconscious mind doesn't have critical analysis. It doesn't have the ability to question or reason or critically analyze. It doesn't have the capacity to rationalize. It only accepts what's being pumped into it. Our conscious mind is our filter. My conscious mind was when I was enduring trauma, my conscious mind would take flight. It was as though my spirit were in a safe, loving space while the abuse went on. They can't touch the human spirit. They can't take love. That's where we all win. And they never counted on the strength of the human spirit. They don't know about that part. What they know about is what our brains do. And my conscious mind was taking flight. My subconscious mind was wide open. And it was like shoving all of the information of what was being done to me down in the deep, dark hole in my mind so that the rest of my mind would function normally as though nothing had even happened. You add occultism to that, the fact that I was being um, prostituted out to um, local politicians and, and and police, so my father could supplement his income. The trauma of being used in child pornography, which, you know, back then was really a big deal. It wasn't available on the internet or anything like that. It was going through, it was, it's horrific under any circumstances, but the manner of getting the information out there was sending a video tape through the U.S. mails. And at that time, since Project Paperclip was in full swing, and there were those with the CIA that were acutely aware that children like me would be easily led, made it where a local politician at that time um, confiscated that pornography of me and approached my father and granted him immunity from prosecution if he would sell me into the Mind Control Project. That politician, was just a little local politician at the time. And his name was Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford shouldn't even have been a local, nobody politician. But nevertheless, people bought into his lies. You look at his name alone. His name is Leslie Lynch King, and he took the name of Ford because people would associate it with Michigan, where I grew up, of Henry Ford, you know, and, and Ford. And so people recognized the name and they thought that meant something and he was elected. It was just a little local politics. But nevertheless, he fooled the people. Consider that on a local level, if we monitor our politics and pay attention to the people who are running, we can make a profound difference in our own communities right on that level before it escalates any further. Look around, stay aware, and when you vote, pay attention that that vote is actually being counted. Gerald Ford, of course, rose high up in government to be the unelected President of the United States, and he headed the Warren Commission that covered the Kennedy assassination. 
The Kennedy assassination was a major turning point when our country was taken over by this criminal faction that I'll continuously refer to, that's in control, because that's not our government. They, these guys need to get out. They've been in way too long, and they have a very adverse agenda with what um, Adolf Hitler and George Bush termed New World Order. But Gerald Ford at that time um, was, was very much active in, in our community and was connected with other political people who were also active in MK Ultra Mind Control. When my father agreed to sell me into the project, that sent me to um, the governor's mansion in Michigan, and the governor at that time was George Romney. He is the father of Mitt Romney. Let's pay attention here <laughs> to, the, to this little series of people that are just weaving through everything, just like mind control being the common thread that's weaving through society's woes. We have the same handful of criminals that continuously um, weave through. And this isn't about finger pointing either because eventually they're all going to die off. Eventually they are going to be move on and we need to know about mind control so that we don't simply replace them with more of the same under the illusion of change. Because that's what they know how to do is just make somebody feel familiar with an illusion of change and continue the same old thing. George Romney was um, actively involved in mind control. And he took what the Catholics had learned from the uh, Spanish Inquisition and other aspects of trauma that was perpetuated in the church as well as the occultism, and knew that that was being used to manipulate the minds of the masses that attended those churches. So he was taking that information and combining it with the hitler himmler research and making a very powerful form of mind control that was going to be added to technologically and used in the Mormon church. The Mormon church is another cult that is very powerful in controlling the minds of their people through trauma and technology, harmonic vibrational technology. This was all known back then. And George Romney had two very significant agendas. Um, and one was to bring the Mormon church into popularity because it was the, the place where we get most of our FBI and, and everything, that's anybody that they need to robotically follow orders and, and carry out um, these, this criminal government agenda. So they needed to have a mind control base to draw from, and they wanted to have someone lead people into it, and here comes the Osmonds. The Osmonds, like the Jacksons, were in the same sub-project of MK Ultra that I was, and that was Project Monarch. It's a genetic mind control. And in that genetic mind control, they took a full control of both the Osmonds and the Jacksons, and using the Osmonds to bring people into the Mormon church, because they were, that really brought the Mormon church to the forefront of people's minds. His other agenda was to permeate the education system. This was even before Goals 2000, um, America 2000, Global Education, Common Core, it's called today, it's all the same mind control agenda in the school system, where they truly believed that they could control the future by controlling the knowledge base of the children as they were growing up. If they could change history and rewrite history, they could teach them propaganda instead that would eventually cause them to be more compliant in our society today. So this was in swing, this was back in the early 60s while all this was just sneaking into our society. We all formulate our thoughts, opinions, and actions based on what we know. And so that was going into the school system. It was going into the media. And it was just getting a big start. If they were going to control us through the media, they needed to control some of the people that were going to be out front 
with that media, like Michael Jackson. If they could control someone like Michael Jackson, harmonically tune his voice, use harmonics in the music, they could use that kind of music in a way that would begin to counter what was happening in the 60s with all the peace and freedom and expanded thinking movement that was going on at that time. So it was um, the start of a, of a very strong agenda. At that time that my dad sold me into the project, he was flown to Boston and trained on how to manipulate the minds of a child with literals and it's not that my dad was really smart or anything. He earned his living as a worm digger. We were very poor when I was real little before he sold me into the project. And he's not the smartest, but he still knew how they taught him how to manipulate um, a mind. And this was the first basis of what the Boston connection is on the Catholic child abuse scandal with Cardinal Law. And I'll come back around on where Cardinal Law was, was sent when he was caught in that, in that scandal. But nevertheless, it was part of the training that my father had at the time. So we're beginning to see how, how this is just a natural flow and going out into our society in so many different ways. When I was at the governor's mansion in Mackinac, I met who had become my owner in the project. There's U.S. Senator Robert Seabird. He's finally gone. Um, he was in office as long as I've been alive. He's had a set of appropriate. He was had a set of appropriations, which means he held the country's purse strings. He delegated money, and one of the very first things that he was doing real hard was to make state reliant on federal funding in the school systems so that they could bring in this education agenda and start to alter history that is being taught in order to um, condition the kids. It wasn't teaching them about propaganda, it was teaching them propaganda. And Bird made sure that states became reliant on that that funding mechanism is still in place today. We all need to pay attention to it. The federal government has no business meddling in the minds of our children. We're all capable of monitoring our schools in which our children learn and our own local level. Be active and, and be aware, just right where you are. We can't change Washington, D.C. at this point in time. Not like not like we need to, but we could start making changes in our own lives, opening our eyes, have a happy mind, realize solutions are out there, that people are implementing solutions and changes are beginning to happen as awareness is rising. I'm really excited to see what people are doing to take back the schools. And even where the federal government has come in with the Common Core agenda, they are beginning to come in from other angles and saying, okay, well, let's put in junior achievement and teach these kids how to think. Let's put in peaceful solution and teach them how to think about peace and kindness and think in ways that TV and video games and society isn't showing them. Just take back that peaceful um, knowledge base that all of us need to have. But it's happening. People are just taking it upon themselves and they're doing it. It's a beautiful thing that we all can do and we all need to do in order to start the positive, necessary change that our children and future generations are counting on all of us to make. As I lost control over my own mind by being sold into the project and deliberately traumatized, systematically traumatized, and having my subconscious mind manipulated in a way that gave whoever was controlling my mind 
total control over my life. I no longer had free will. I was living their will. I didn't have soul expression because I didn't have free thought. Without free thought, there's, there's no free will, and without that free will, we don't have the soul expression necessary. So we need to be very careful to maintain our free thought. Cherish that free thought. Expand thinking. You know, and continue learning more and more and more because as we learn more, like this information on mind control, it's the one piece of the puzzle that all of a sudden, whoa, so that's what's happening. Of course people aren't all like we're being told. We're, we're the peaceful people that we know we are. We all, that we are the majority. If we weren't that way innately within us, they wouldn't need to be manipulating our subconscious. They wouldn't need to be trying to take control of us by controlling that subconscious and manipulating our free will, soul expression. When the trauma occurred over and over, the more and more of my conscious mind took flight until I was totally robotic, operating on a subconscious level. I didn't have conscious awareness anymore. And in the, without having conscious awareness, I had no concept of time. I didn't know how old I was, how much time had passed. Without a concept of time, there's no real concept of distance. So I wouldn't even know, because I didn't know how long it took to get from point A to point B, that there was that distance from point A to point B. Boy, does that ever mess up geography. I'm still relearning geography and how things are actually, you know, set in, in the world because it's, it's really difficult. I, it seemed like everything was just jumbled in whatever was the moment that I was living at that time. Without conscious awareness, there's no ability to think further. There's no ability to future think. There's no awareness of what has happened in the past. All you have is the now and doing exactly what you're told to do. Being conditioned for this, um, Gerald Ford went on to become the unelected president of the United States and my victimization and MK Ultra mind control rose proportionately. Take a look at Gerald Ford's cabinet. He had Donald Rumsfeld as a Secretary of Defense. Of course, Donald Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense under Bush too, and Rumsfeld is, you know, follow the money and, and see where else he's getting it, and it's through the pharmaceutical companies, Monsanto, who gave us aspartame, the artificial sweetener that so many people use. It's got so many different names out there, equal and you know, other things. But this particular artificial sweetener is actually a chemical. Why are we letting a, a chemical company make our food anyway? Yeah. <laughs> but what happens with aspartame is it, it dumbs people down. It, it takes away critical analysis and, it, and it, it just dulls the conscious thinking. I was fed copious quantities of, of aspartame. And when I was going into full absolute robotic mind control, my diet was definitely controlled. I had sleep, food, and water deprivation. Um, I was given all this aspartame all the time. And um, I just, I, I really lost an ability for um, any kind of, of free thought, conscious thought at all. And the aspartame aspect, with, for all that I was exposed to, that was one of the hardest things for me, was coming off aspartame because I'd given so much of it. I was like addicted to it, and it was really hard to get off of it. It's like nothing else could quench my thirst like a diet drink, you know, <laughs> or something like that. It was really, it was difficult. But understanding what it was doing to me um, made it easier to get away from that. So here we have Donald Rumsfeld in Ford's cabinet. Um, George Bush, senior, head of the CIA. George Bush 
has been the power behind the scenes throughout my whole life. He's still alive, and I know he is still pulling strings. The president is only a figurehead. He's put out there for all of us to gravitate to. Somebody like Ronald Reagan, who tell us all the really wonderful things that we want to hear about downsizing government. While uh, at the same time, you know, the whole, the whole economy is just, just crashing behind him. But, but he said the right things, and he was a figurehead out there for everybody to see. He was being manipulated, too. If he had any uh, ideas of, of doing something different um, when he was shot, when he, the assassination attempt occurred, um, it certainly took that um, steam out of him for being able to implement anything. George Bush Sr. was absolutely in control through the Reagan Bush administration. Check and see, follow Hinckley into the Mormon church, high up in the Mormon church, his father was. And they are very close friends of George Bush Sr. Is that a coincidence? Come on. You know, there are no coincidences. Coincidences are pretty glaring for all of us to be able to follow some really strong truths. George Bush Jr., I know for a fact, was under mind control. Absolute, total robotic mind control. Look back on George Bush um, Jr. and see how he acted. It was pretty, um, pretty, pretty dull-witted. Um, and that wasn't an act. You said that was mind control. And that is, that is what it looks like. And at that time, they just figured it would be a lot easier to pull somebody's strings than try to manipulate them like they did Reagan, just pull up strings and, you know, and, and let, it, let it be easier. And the same criminals again, behind the scenes, ushering in what Adolf Hitler and George Bush termed the New World Order. The New World Order agenda is one where the people are totally compliant and it's like a, a slave society because they can't relate to the human spirit or the power of love. That's where we win and where they just completely lose and keep losing. If they would leave it to us, we would have a natural global unity just by natural attrition because we've got the internet these days, we've got communications, we get to see other countries, we've got more travel, and the differences that we see in other countries are something to learn from and embrace, and it's just, it's beautiful. I'm so glad I have had the opportunity to travel and, and see for myself that that is the way that people are all over the world. And if we were left to that kind of unity, we would have a natural one world of just, of, of just who we are, of just love and peace. We don't need wars to force it on. We don't need trauma to force it on. We don't need um, sanctions and rules. We don't need all of that nonsense that a handful of criminals think they are so much better than us that they need to manipulate all us little, little people around. Back to Ford's cabinet. <laughs> um, Dick Cheney. His Secretary of State. Dick Cheney I, I, was subjected to during Ford's administration. I knew him throughout my victimization in my years in the Reagan Bush administration. He worked in the Pentagon. I worked under him in the Pentagon. He knows that torture is what programs people. It's the trauma. It's the way the brain works. You torture somebody, they will say anything you want them to say. They're not necessarily going to say whatever. You can't torture information out of somebody. You can only torture information in and make people say what you want them to say. Torture just doesn't work that way. There's no justification for it. Dick Cheney um, is, is one of the most vile, cruel people I've, I ever encountered. And even at that, I don't live with bitterness or hatred. I'm not speaking out to say 
Dick Cheney's evil. I don't need you all know that anyway. You know? I don't need to be doing that just because I, I had to work under him. Instead, I'm saying it so that we all know what it looks like, so that we know how mind control works. He knows how mind control works, and he certainly used it on me. Um, in Ford's cabinet was uh, Jack Valenti. Jack Valenti was his press secretary. Um, he also happened to be in the motorcade when Kennedy was assassinated, which is just an interesting little aside. But Jack Valenti was head of the Motion Picture Association. That gave him all the power in Hollywood. He decided what we could see on our TVs. That's a very, very powerful position. And it took the grip on the media to be able to alter our knowledge base through the news, through, uh, through movies, or, or whatever else we're being fed through that TV box. We all need to think out of that box because it's not, it's not an answer. It could have so much potential if people would use it right. We could show people's differences and celebrate those instead of, you know, trying to make it like some big evil um, something. But anyway, that was a grip on uh, the media that was also in this transitional time when this criminal faction took control of our government. Jack Valenti is a very close, was a very close friend of Ronald Reagan's. And... Um, and I, I had cause to see him what, during my, um, the operations I worked on a White House Pentagon level and my exposure to, um, to Reagan and, and so many others. Um, one person I was exposed to that I, I do want to mention is Bill Clinton. Um, Bill Clinton was a little bit different than the rest. But in the early years, while he was still governor of Arkansas, he was running the cocaine operations that the CIA is, is, was so heavily, is so heavily involved in this funding black budget operations to usher in this, um, this new world order. So I'm not saying um, that, that Bill Clinton is not just you know, the same as the rest of them or anything like that. The fact is that Bill Clinton was the only one who smoked marijuana. He smoked herb. And that was considered the most horrible evil by everybody else that was around me because what happens with that is it opens neuron pathways in the brain. If trauma is occurring and compartmentalization is occurring in the brain, our military is trained that way for compartmentalized memory in the brain on that subconscious level. It's set up that way. And if anybody in our military smoked marijuana, it would open those neuron pathways of the brain and the programming would just go awry. So the, the, I was exposed to a lot of negativity about marijuana because it could have started to break up my programming. Well, Bill Clinton wasn't so opposed to it, nor was he a pedophile. He absolutely, I, I was present when he and George Bush Sr. were dis having a discussion. I had cause to have heard that discussion. And Bill Clinton did not believe that that was necessary to, um, for control. Technology was coming on real strong, um, and he was not going to sexually abuse his own child because he felt like, you know, that, that she had genetics. Okay, I mentioned two little tiny sparks of difference there. And, oh man, if only he could just get one more piece of the puzzle and expand his thinking and expose some of this criminal nonsense that's been going on behind the scenes in Washington, D.C. for decades that he knows of and I know of. Be aware that Hillary is very much for mind control. She has the strongest, one of the strongest agendas for controlling a population of anyone I ever heard that I was ever exposed to. And she is, it has been planned, it was planned that, that Bill Clinton was going to be put in the office of president for what he'd done for, the, for funding the, the whole mechanism. Um, George Bush Jr. was going to go in because he was an absolute total puppet. And there was going to be an illusion of change. 
to, and Hillary is definitely still being held back for that illusion of change. Because when people um, become disillusioned with Republicans, they put a Democrat in, when they become disillusioned with Democrats, they put Republicans in. The fact is there's no diff difference between Democrats, Republicans, black, white, male, female. You know, we gotta just pay attention to something a lot deeper on the people that we elect and that we allow in positions of power. Pay attention on a local level because on a national level we have a very serious problem when you follow the money of the Diebold electronic voting machines you're going to go right straight back to Bush Senior and Dick Cheney once again. If they have an electronic voting machine capability, do you really believe those elections are being manipulated? And they're going to just act like, oh, we chose this illusion of change. We chose it. We have not. So what we need to do is gather our strength of spirit and stop following leaders that we didn't elect. Implement that kind of Gandhian total non-compliance. <laughs> Pay attention to what happens in your own society, in the school systems. What's happening in the churches? Pay attention to all that. Because once your eyes are open to this truth, it will give you an ability to see how easy the solution is in light of truth, love, peace, and strength of spirit. I'm seeing, I, speaking of trauma, being involved in trauma like, like Mark and I are, it's amazing that we get to see, have such a beautiful view of how much people are doing exactly that. There is a peaceful, I'm not going to use the revolution word, I'm not supposed to as you as government whistleblower anyway. There's a peaceful evolution going on, and it's not being shown on television. Why should they? I mean, it's not going to traumatize anybody. It's, it's peace, it's natural, and it's a flow, and it's just people reclaiming control over their own lives. The same way that I had to. The details of, of what a what I was exposed to and what I, the operations I had to uh, carry out are in Transformation of America. Access Denied, our book Access Denied is one I'm so excited about. It tells our journey and has all the healing details and information that Mark taught me in it. As a result, people all over the world are taking that information and they're applying it to themselves and they're healing from varying levels of trauma, child abuse, cult cult mind control, <coughs> PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which all of our military has, military special forces, people from all walks of life, all around the world are healing with the methods that Mark taught me. When Mark came along, it's February 8, 1988, and that's when my life began. I existed up until that point, and Mark rescued me out of, and my, me and my daughter out of our MK Ultra mind control existence. At that time, I didn't know who I was, how old I was, where I'd been. I couldn't think to know any of that. But I was turning 30, and at 30, we have electrochemical changes in our brain naturally. And at 30, a lot of people start having memories start to surface. So before that could happen, because of the government secrets that I've been exposed to, I was to be killed before, you know, I might happen to remember. The thing is, they never counted on a good man like Mark Phillips taking his insider knowledge and using it to restore a mind rather than control one. Never thought about that aspect. It didn't occur to them that I could be deprogrammed. They didn't know anybody could be. They didn't, because they don't understand the strength of the human spirit or the power of love. They don't know that aspect. So when Mark first rescued me, I was safe for the first time in my life. And somewhere deep inside, I knew that this was really big, but I couldn't consciously think, I couldn't rationalize, nor could I even think to trust Mark to accept what he was telling me, sharing with me that I could use for healing. How could I trust anybody at that point? I mean, it, 
he, he may as well have been an alien or an angel or something because he just, I didn't know that good people like him existed in this world anymore. It was beyond my realm of experience. So I couldn't think to trust. But because I was operating on a subconscious level, I had uh, heightened intuition and, and my telepathy developed. Because when a person can't consciously think, the brain um, hyper develops in other areas. It's like being you know, blasted into other parts of the brain where um, I had 44 times visual acuity, for example, where I, it's like having eyes in the back of the head because I had whites around my eyes, like so many people do, that have been traumatized. Because it's like you try to see something that might be coming up behind you before it happens. So you get this visual acuity. Hey, we have a capacity in our brains. This is exciting that we actually can do that. We can choose that for ourselves if we knew. Just to know that we can do that is our first step towards embracing it and using that for um, healing vision problems um, and, and, and other aspects. I also had um, a heightened uh, telepathy where it's like a real strong sense of people. It's not, um, it's not like knowing every word that they're thinking or something like that. It's more like knowing an intention and um, it, animals are very telepathic. <coughs> TV doesn't represent them any more than it does us. You know, I mean, all we see in nature shows is animals eating each other, you know, what they have. And it's like, a, you know, all this horse stuff. Besides, that traumatizes us further, too. But in reality, out in nature, which I spend a lot of time in nature, animals intercommunicate. And they don't make all the same sounds as each other or do it the same ways, but they know. They know. And there's like this piece when it comes to one pond, you know. It's like, okay, we can go there, and, and everybody is thirsty, everybody needs that water, and they share. Um, Mark and I feed the, the wild animals because we live out in the country and we put a little dish of food out there and all the wild animals. The other day we had a fox, a raccoon, and a skunk all eating from the same dish at the same time. Put the girl right behind them, you know, just kind of but That's how they are, you know, they're really telepathic and they intercommunicate. They're really cool. Mark had a bunch of animals when he first rescued me. He had fox and raccoon and he had dogs and he had all these animals and all these animals trusted him completely and they, they were just real loving with him. I'd never seen that before because people who abuse children abuse animals and vice versa. It's a disregard for life. It's a, a, whole, a whole different level. It's a, such a strong truth that when Mark and I began speaking out on this, the um, the Humane Society and Human Services got together and they said, okay, when you get an abused animals, let us know, we'll check the children. When we have abused children, check the animals. Because it is that common of a thing. So what I'm seeing with Mark is that animals just totally trust him. And I thought, that thought, I sensed. If they could trust him, I could too. And that was the first step, just to be able to trust, to know that there's something better something more out there. He strapped a watch on my wrist because I had no concept of time. And it gave me a concept of time. A concept of time equates to a concept of awareness. It's very powerful for anybody who's been traumatized or been through something to be able to monitor time and stay consciously aware so that they don't dissociate and aren't being misled by someone else. The watch is a very important part. It took, it took some time before I gained conscious awareness, before I gained conscious thought. And I remember the day that it first happened, when I first went into that part of my brain where I could have a conscious thought. That conscious awareness thought was like, it, it had a feeling of like, whoa, you know, like, whoa, you know, I could feel things. It was, it was so tangible, I could feel again, you know, because I was consciously acknowledging that I was feeling something. That is an amazing thing. 
When we see people who've been horribly abused and they cut themselves and the horrible things that they do trying to feel, it's because they don't have that conscious awareness of feeling to where they can connect with it to the degree that they need. Strap on a watch and start writing out memory. Writing out memory is the biggest tool that Mark gave me. Starting to write takes the logic part of the brain and so all this repressed memory of what had happened that was shoved down in these little dark holes in my brain would be shifted over to logic as I wrote it out. And there it is, right in front of me, where I become consciously aware and it spans all of my being. With that conscious awareness, I didn't have to get emotional about it, like, oh, look what happened to me, or anything like that. You know, I already survived it. And besides, Mark gave me another tool that was really, really cool and really important for me. He said, voice no negatives without a solution. Think about that. Well, I couldn't just grab and complain about what happened. What? I had to think of a solution? Uh, think of a solution that meant I had to push my brain to think further. I had to be able to expand my thought. And with that came like a, a, a need to, to program myself to start thinking. So I would put little notes up to myself, like on a mirror, on a refrigerator, um, that said, think further, consider other perceptions, consider other angles, and of course, voice no negatives without a solution. This is very important. <laughs> my very first step towards being able to have a happy mind and to be able to think further and have clarity of thinking. But that took some time. I had to exercise my brain in a lot of ways. And, uh, but the most important part was writing out memory. Everybody who's been through any kind of trauma should write out memory. Even today, if I get so fed up with the news or something, I just can't stand it anymore. I'll write a poem um, with uh, a solution and possibility and to be able to expand the thinking of it because just, just writing is still you know, shifting what would otherwise be traumatizing into a logic part of the brain where I can actually deal with it. Logic is like conscious critical analysis where we can think things through and be able to make some sense of what's happening in our world today. So if the world is just looking too dark, if it's getting too depressing, right. Focus on a solution. Get out in society. See what you can do to make a difference. Those are very important keys. Take a walk. A walk in nature. When you walk, it uses the right and the left brain to be moving your feet and do the walking. So it's very healing right there. I'd have memory flashes coming in. Oh boy, that childhood abuse that I went through with my father that I didn't know was really abused because it was a whole, my whole world. And besides, it started before I could even, you know, while I was still an infant, so I didn't have any way to judge that, you know? So it allowed for me to be able to um, know what happened in a way that wasn't filed in my brain under abuse. So when people have gaps in their childhood or, or, or in their memory and they don't know what happened, um, if especially if it's early childhood before age five while the brain is still forming, it may not be filed under abuse. You know, a person asks themselves, wow, was I abused as a child? It's not likely to get any response from the brain that way. Sexual abuse has pleasure to it too. It could be, it could be filed in a really unexpected direction. But writing out memory is the key. Taking a walk starts flashes of memory. When you're in safe, 
when you're at peace inside, when you start making a note of that little flash of memory that's intruding on your present moment. If you find yourself doing something, limiting yourself and your own actions because you you're this or you're that. Well, who said you're this or you're that? Why are, why are you thinking that way? Write it out. Write it out. Continue. Always write it out. Then ask yourself specific questions. And those questions are in Access Denied, as Mark taught me. You ask yourself where, how you got there, where you went after. And all of a sudden, you're bridging events. And it's taken it out of that little dark compartment of the brain. And it's bringing it out into full. I don't focus on my past. I don't, you know, I'm not of that kind of a victim mentality. Instead, of, I, I've, I've addressed the issues. I know my own truth. And knowing my own truth, I have inner peace. And with that inner peace, when you know your own truth, that is where the happy mind begins to come in. And you can start thinking and realizing the possibilities and the potentials that are in society. Now that I've, I've written up memory, I've healed, um, Mark and I released the um, Transformation of America. I didn't want to release it because it was horrible and people have enough horror in their lives, but um, it was essential because it was a testimony for the U.S. Congressional Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence Oversight. And they were censored from the information for reasons of national security. <laughs> Congressional oversight on intelligence is censored for reasons of national security. People need to know this. Upon the advice of an attorney, we released the book in mass. Now, it's, it's been translated into numerous languages. It's in law libraries worldwide. College students are writing their thesis on the information. They're being taught it in major universities, and especially in uh, the areas of law. Um, it's also being um, used in mental health, but not as much as the access denied. When Trance was out, and Mark and I began um, speaking out, it was I was motivated by love for humanity and love for my daughter to bring the information to light. As the books went into translation, we would speak in the different countries where it was being translated. We spoke in Germany, which is an amazing experience considering the Hitler, Hitler connection. Those people are acutely aware that the United States is being manipulated and controlled. They consider we're more controlled than the Nazis were. We're dumbed down further. Not all of us here, but as a, as a nation. Because of the technology that's being used, the harmonics, the music, the manipulations through the media, the terror, the trauma that's been going on for so long. They know. But they've also reclaimed control over their lives. And they hope this truth will reach everyone and set them free because knowledge is our only defense against mind control. As U.S. government whistleblowers, bound by the Whistleblowers Protection Act, with national security on this, with all of Mark's brilliant expertise in marketing, we are not allowed to advertise, we're not allowed to um, solicit, we're counting on people to spread the word, to get the information out there. Person to person, mouth to mouth, is how the information started spreading. Now it's gone global, and now it's being taught in schools, and all of that was done because truth is very powerful. And it was brought to light on wings of love, and love is the most powerful force in the universe. That's a powerful combination that has made a big difference. Mark and I wanted to get information out to people because we hear from people, hundreds of emails from all over the world every day, from people who are wanting to heal from whatever they've experienced in their lives. 
when we were in Italy with a translation of our book in Italy, it was right at the time that the Catholic child abuse scandal came to light. Cardinal Law had just been shifted over to the Basilica in, in Rome. And it was a very pivotal time in Italy where they, when the Catholic child abuse scandal was brought to light and they realized that the abuse of the children was being used for mind control manipulation. The head of Italy's psychiatric department went on national TV, this was right while we were there, and held up our book and told people to read it. It was very important, it was true, it was essential for them to know what was happening with the huge transition that was beginning to take place at that time. Even though, um, you know, like so many priests, that they just get shifted around, you know, it's like um, creating illusions of change. Um, the figureheads that are out there that I say the presidency is, when the same powers are in control behind the scene, you know, bear in mind that this new pope, um, who I'm certainly not judging, he, he could be just to have total passion for um, going against the child abuse in the church for all I know, but watch behind him. Watch who's really got the money and pulling, you know, do, doing the manipulation behind the scenes. We have to watch more than just the figureheads that they have out front. But Italy was a, was a wonderful um, experience to see how so many people who had been subjected to Catholic abuse were healing. But they wanted the healing tools. They wanted to know how to write out memory. They wanted to know how to cope with their memory once they did remember it. And so we wrote and released Access Denied. Access Denied for reasons of national security was used um, way high up in the um, Catholic child abuse scandal lawsuits and everything to help people heal. And it was, it went from that, that top down and reached a lot of people that way. It's good to see the negative of my experience um, helping so many others and being used in such a positive way. I encourage each of you to read these books, um, gain the insight, the hope, the solutions that are offered, um, even the coping skills, you know, for dealing with the, the horrors today, and get the information out there. And when your eyes are open and you see someone who's been horribly abused, you'll be able to help them with the information. Well, just, hey, it's within you to heal yourself, and here's how. You know, uh, share the book. Share just the, the information from the book. Whatever you're inclined to do, go out and do it, because the word is spreading through people like you doing it. Um, you may have seen our, our dear friend and associate, Shayla, who's at, at our table helping us out and assisting us in so many ways. She and I are real active in our local community, making a difference where we can. Of course, the first thing I'm thinking is, okay, child abuse, you know, that's a really important thing. And I went and checked where the uh, child ad advocacy centers were in the mental health areas, and they were implementing our, our information. They didn't know who that it came from us, but it was our information. <laughs> the judge, the judge is so harsh on child abuse because they know what it does to the minds of the children. They're real hard on those criminals. Our sheriff is real hard on those criminals. Pay attention to your sheriff. Your sheriff is our last line of defense against the federal government. If there's going to be a federal raid, it comes to the sheriff. You have the ability to know your sheriff and to make sure the right person is elected for that very important and powerful job. And because of that, my friend Shayla and I, we campaign for that judge on, on their um, um, elections. We campaigned for the sheriff and we kind of expanded a little another direction because with HARP and all the environmental changes and the global changes that are happening, I know that our planet has its own changes but they're accelerated because of HARP, you know, check out HARP. And I wanted to make a difference in the environment with, in the best way it seemed was through education. 
So we went into the school systems and talked with the children about litter, recycle, the environment, caring about the environment, and realizing that they all just simply needed to know, to think, to care again. Because with all we're being, the, the kids are being bombarded with, they're, they're getting real hopeless, and we need to give them hope. We need to show them where they can make a difference and how, what a big difference they can make. Picking up, picking up one piece of litter could save an animal, and that's, that's just a, a big step. So we are making differences in those little ways. Look around your community and see what you can do to make a difference. And everybody, Gather your strength of spirit with this truth. Truth does make us free. Free to expand your thinking and free to evolve in light of truth and evolve with love and keep that evolution going. Thank you so much. whatsoever and he said to me then that he didn't want me a piece at a time he wanted me all at once until I knew who I was and could give love because living love is giving love and that was a huge motive to be able to heal and live the love I am so that we could fall in love like we have. <laughs> with Mark uh, and uh, had some emails flying back around and I said, how many people are you expecting? He said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So um, I, I didn't have any previous experience with Mark and he said, well, we've sold the next number of tickets. So that's a far cry from full house, but okay. <laughs> so I, I, sent, um, I sent up enough books that I thought that would take care of that. Um, <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> we have a really good amount out there, and, and for those of you um, who have not endured uh, horrific childhood sexual abuse, um, then both books will make sense. If you, you read Trance first, and then read Access Denied. Access Denied is a self-help book, and it's the antidote to trance. I don't enjoy having trance out there and having it influence anyone else's uh, memory that they recover. It's written in such a way that, um, well, I'll tell you a <coughs> quick story. It's got some subliminals in it. It's also got some places and things and time, like the map maker puts in, in his map to protect the integrity of his map. I made sure that trance had those in there. So when people came and told me that they were a victim of this, uh, I just had to admit that. So I, I knew where to send them for help. Um, access denied took 16 years to write. 
and it's verbatim. If the solutions, and there's no, there's no subliminals in it. What I, I put the subliminals in it. A lot of love. <laughs> yeah, a lot of love. And Kathy asked me to get it to treatment two or three times. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not doing that. I said, it, it, it doesn't, it needs to stand on its own feet. Um, if somebody, any doctor can come and tell me, a physician, treating physician, that it's not going to work, can't work, then I, I have a few questions I'd like to ask them, uh, because it does. And the nice part about it is it helps everybody help themselves. You stop looking for answers outside yourself and look inwardly. You'll get them. They're your experiences. We, we deeply appreciate this opportunity, and I, I've expressed it numerously to Mark and others. Uh, and John, carrying us around. Good gracious. Um, the fact remains is, I, I do believe this is the last public presentation we'll do in the United States. We, we, uh, we continue to do it offshore. Um, we're working primarily with physicians and social workers and, and uh, in many in some instances, uh, political people. Um, it's been an opportunity, a learning curve for, for us. Uh, we can't make a living on selling books. Um, it, it barely pays to have the books reprinted. And we cannot have a publisher, we can't sell publishing rights. We can't sell a movie, uh, our life rights to trans. Uh, it's gone, we do. It will never resurface. So I said, well, as long as I'm alive, be out there.